thank you for coming uh, to Colloquium. Um, uh, thank you to all of you who attended the retreat. Uh, I know if you weren't there, uh, it was because you couldn't be. Um, we'll catch you next year. Um, but uh, today, uh, we're thinking ahead to uh, the future of our program with a, a candidate uh, a trainer. So today's candidate, though, is not new to UW-Madison. Uh, Jin Gao uh, did her PhD here, uh, finished in 2016 under the direction of Emery Bresnik. Uh, at the McArdle Center, where she became uh, enamored with uh, blood cells, uh, and uh, she continues to work on that through her postdocs, and, and now uh, as a brand new assistant professor. So after she left Emory Bresnik's lab, she went to Albert Einstein School of Medicine, uh, where she did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship, moving from embryonic stem cells to aging, uh, stem, uh, aging uh, bone cells. Uh, and then came back here in 2020 to do a second postdoc uh, with uh, Jing Zhang, uh, one of our trainers, uh, again um, uh, at uh, McArdle. Oh, I guess uh, Emery was at uh, CRB, not McArdle, yes, right? Yes, sorry about that. Uh, cellular regenerative biology. So she's been in cellular regenerative biology. She's been at McArdle. And now she has recently landed uh, as an assistant professor at uh, the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. You may recognize uh, that department as the department uh, that houses our very own grad school dean, uh, in addition to, we must certainly be the newest faculty uh, of that department. Uh, Xin Gao has been a professor for exactly 20 days uh, as of today. So let's give her a warm welcome uh, to present uh, her research on hematopoietic stem cells. Thank you. Thank you for the for the really nice introduction. So I'm Shin. I'm a brand new assistant professor in the pathology department. So uh, the title of my talk today is about the role of the bone marrow niche. Oops. Yeah. The role of the bone marrow niche in regulating the normal and the XS1 mutant hematopoietic stem cells. So I'd like to start by briefly introducing the background. So we know that the hematopoietic stem cells sit on top of the hematopoietic hierarchy and can give rise to all the mature blood cells. So hematopoietic stem cells are primarily located in the bone marrow in adults and characterized by the self-renew and the differentiation potential. And this regulation of the HSCs could lead to the blood diseases, including the leukemia. And more importantly, HSCs are the basis for the bone marrow transplantation which is the therapy for the majority of the blood diseases. So this rare but important HSC population reside in a specialized microenvironment in the bone marrow, we call the bone marrow niche, which consisted of multiple cellular components as shown here. So this bone marrow niche ensured the hematopoietic uh, homeostasis by controlling the proliferation, differentiation, self renew and trafficking of HSCs. So defining the cellular components in this bone marrow niche and understanding how they work together to regulate HSCs is very important. So uh, recent, a recent study highlights the uh, vasculature here and their associated stroma cells as really important niche components in the bone marrow. As, as you can see here, the nerves also innovate the bone marrow. So one of the story I'd like to highlight today is our recently published work, which identified the sensory nervous system as essential niche component in the bone marrow, which is required for the stem cell mobilization. So my talk today is divided into two parts. First is about the neuron regulation of the hematopoietic stem cell mobilization. This is a published work. And the second part, I will talk about some ongoing project in my lab which is about the aged bone marrow microenvironment regulates the excess one mutant induced clonal hematopoiesis. So now let's move on to the first part, the neuron regulation of the stem cell mobilization. So as mentioned earlier, the bone marrow transplant is a procedure that used to treat the blood diseases. So what is bone, mar bone marrow transplant? So bone marrow transplant is a procedure that infuses HSC from the donor into the patient to recover the hematopoietic system. The question is how to get the HSCs for the transplant. Since the majority, majority of HSCs reside in the bone marrow, 
So bone marrow used to be the only site for collecting the HSCs by needle aspiration. However, since we know that HSCs can be mobilized from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood, then the mobilized peripheral blood quickly took over and became the more preferred method. The other source for collecting the stem cells is a core blood. But the limitation with core blood is the small number of HSCs per donation. So, so far, the predominant source for collecting the stem cells for the transplant is the mobilized peripheral blood. And the GCSF is the typical reagent used in the clinic to get HSCs out of the bone marrow and mobilize into the peripheral blood. However, there is considerable variability in their response to GCSF. Up to 30% of the patients do not mobilize sufficient numbers of stem cells for this transplantation therapy. So to improve the stem cell mobilization, it's important to understand the mechanism. So under the study state, HSCs are attracted within the bone marrow, mainly by the CXL12 CXCF4 axis. So pyrovascular stroma cells are very important niche components in the bone marrow, secreting high levels of CXL12. And the binding of CXL12 to its receptor CXCF4 play a key role in attracting HSCs within the bone marrow. And the suppression of the CXL12 CXCF4 axis is the main mechanism by which GCSF induced HSC mobilized into the peripheral blood. So our work is focused on the nervous system. So we know that the nervous system is divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system can be further divided into two components, the afferent neurons, also called the sensory neurons, which is sending the information from the periphery back to the central nervous system. And the other half is the efferent neurons, which sending the information from the central nervous system outwards to the periphery. So in the past 15 or 20 years, the Frenet lab has contributed a lot to define the function of the sympathetic nerves in the bone marrow. But the function of the sensory neurons in the bone marrow remains totally unknown. So to study the function of the sensory neurons in the bone marrow, we first surveyed the total nerve density in the bone marrow by analyzing the expression of different neural markers by the immunofluorescence. As you can see here, the CGRP label for the sensory neurons, TH for the sympathetic nerves, and tubulin beta 3 for all the peripheral nerves. So from this quantification data, you see that the CGRP labeled sensory neurons compromise the majority of the nerves in the bone marrow. So next, to study the function of the sensory neurons in the bone marrow, we use two different approaches to deplete the sensory neuron. So first is the pharmacological approach. As shown here, we treat the mice with RTX, which can kill the sensory neuron by overstimulation. So four weeks after the RTX injection, GCSF was injected into the mice to induce the stem cell mobilization. And very interestingly, as you can see here, depletion of the sensory neurons impaired the stem cell mobilization because the number of HSCs that mobilize into the peripheral blood is significantly reduced in the RTX mice as compared to the control. So next, to further evaluate the number of functional HSCs that mobilize into the peripheral blood, we did the transplantation assay by transplanting the mobilized peripheral blood from the control or the RTX mice into the lethally irradiated recipient mice. Then as you can see here, that mouse received peripheral blood from the RTX mice showed the decreased chimerism, which means the reduced repopulating activity as compared to the control. So this data suggests again that depletion of the sensory neurons impaired the stem cell mobilization from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood. So this result was further confirmed by the using the genetic mouse model here, crossing the NEV1.8 queen mice with IDTM mice. So NEV1.8 is specifically expressed on the sensory neurons. By crossing with the IDTA, we can efficiently deplete the sensory neuron up to 95%. So here, the result is really consistent. You see that in the absence of the sensory neuron, the number of HSCs that mobilized into the peripheral blood is significantly reduced. So all these data shown in this slide suggest that the sensory neurons promote the stem cell mobilization. So we know that the sensory neurons secrete two different neural peptides, CGRP and the substance P, 
So next, I evaluate the specific contribution of these neurotransmitters to the stem cell mobilization. So here I designed this experiment. First, we treat the mice with RTX to deplete the sensory neurons. Then we give the mice CGRP back into these mice before the GCSF treatment. And interestingly, as you can see here, the CGRP treatment significantly increased the level of CGRP in the bone marrow and substantially increased the number of HSCs mobilized into the peripheral blood. And more interestingly, you see that the CGRP treatment can rescue the mobilization defect in the RTX mice. However, with the substance P treatment, we did not observe any improvement in terms of the stem cell mobilization. So this data suggests that the sensory nerve derived CGRP signals, but not substance P, promote the stem cell mobilization. So to first understand how CGRP regulates the HSC mobilization, we evaluate the function of the CGRP receptor, which is formed by a heterodimer of RAMP1 and CRL. Both of these two subunits are required to initiate the response to CGRP. So here we cross the RAMP1 head mice to RAMP1 heads to get the white type and homozygous mute mice for the experiment. Then, as you can see here, when we give the mice GCSF treatment, the RAMP1 knockout mice showed the mobilization defect. So this data suggests that depletion of the CGRP receptor RAMP1 impairs the stem cell mobilization from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood. So the next question is, what the third target of CGRP? Is RAMP1 required on the hematopoietic cells or other niche components? So to answer this question, I first look at the RAMP1 expression in different niche components and hematopoietic cells. So as you can see here, RAMP1 is highly expressed in HSCs, but also expressed at low level in the stromal compartment in the bone marrow. So to distinguish whether RAMP1 is required on hematopoietic cells or on the niche components, we did the reciprocal transplantation experiment by transplanting the RAMP1 white type or the knockout cells into the lethally irradiated white type or the RAMP1 knockout re recipient to generate four different groups with either donor or the host as Y type or the knockout. And eight weeks after the transplant, we gave the mice GCSF treatment. Interestingly, as you can see here, when the donor cells are Y type, the recipient of donor cells are knockout, the recipient of Y type, you see the mobilization defect. However, when the donor cells are Y type, the host a ramp one knockout, the mobilization is normal. So this data suggests that the ramp one is required on the hematopoietic cells to promote the stem cell mobilization. So to further confirm this hematopoietic origin of the defect, I cross the valve one I pre mice with CRL flux mice. So valve one is specifically expressed in hematopoietic cells. As I mentioned earlier, CRL is one of the subunits of the CGRP receptor. So by crossing the VAV1 acrimides with CRL flux, flux mice, we can deplete the CGRP receptor from the hematopoietic cells. So the, resist, the result show, is really consistent. As you can see here, the number of HSCs that mobilize into the peripheral blood is significantly reduced in the absence of the CGRP receptor in the hematopoietic cells suggesting that the CGRP acts on the hematopoietic cells through the CGRP receptor to promote the stem cell mobilization. So to make a small summary here, first I identified the sensory neurons at the compromised majority of the nerves in the bone marrow. Then interestingly, we found that depletion of the sensory neuron suppressed the GSSF induced stem cell mobilization. And further we found that the sensory neuron derived CGRP, but not substance P signals, promote the stem cell mobilization. And to first understand the mechanism, we evaluate the function of the CGRP receptor, and we found that depletion of the CGRP receptor uh, compromised the stem cell mobilization. And this CGRP acts through the CGRP receptor that expressed on the hematopoietic cells to promote the stem cell mobilization. So the next question is, 
within the hematocritic stem cells, what is the cell target of CGRP? If the CGRP ramp one signals are HSC autonomous, or the ramp one is required on other hematocritic cells. So to answer this question, we first look at the ramp one expression in different hematocritic cells. So as you can see here, ramp one is highly expressed in HSCs, but also expressed on macrophage. As macrophage are known to regulate the stem cell mobilization, so this leads to two possibilities. The first is that the CGRP act directly on HSCs to promote the mobilization. The second possibility is that the CGRP acts through the macrophage to indirectly regulate the stem cell mobilization. So if this were the case, we would expect that the CGRP cannot promote the stem cell mobilization in the absence of the macrophage. So to test this possibility, we treat the mice with the crogenate lipsome, which can deplete the macrophage. As you can see here, consistent with the published data, we found that the depletion of the macrophage in the bone marrow reduced the level of CXL12 in the, in the bone marrow extracellular fluid. And also you see that macrophage depletion increased the number of HSCs mobilized into the peripheral blood. But more interesting, as you can see here, the CGRP can further promote the stem cell mobilization, even in the absence of the macrophage. Suggesting that the CGRP is not acting on the macrophage to promote the stem cell mobilization. So next question is whether CGRP ramp one signals are HSC autonomous. So we first test this possibility in vitro by putting the ramp one white type or the ramp one knockout cells in the trans wall and CXL12 in the bottom. Then you see that the ramp one knockout cells show the mobilization defect as compared to the white type. And to further confirm this result in vitro, we generate the mixed chimeric mice. So in the control group, a mixture of the white type CD40, CD45.1 cells and the ramp one white type CD45.2 cells are mixed and injected into the lethally irradiated recipient mice. And in the ramp one knockout group, so a mixture of the white type CD45.1 cells and ramp one knockout CD45.2 cells were injected into the recipient mice. So eight weeks after the transplant, the GCSF was injected into the mice to induce the stem cell mobilization. And interestingly, in the control group, as what we expected, you see that both white type 0.1 and 0.2 cells can be equally mobilized into the peripheral blood. But in the ramp one knockout group, even in the presence of the white type hematopoietic cells, the ramp one knockout HSCs still show the mobilization defect, suggesting that the CGRP ramp one signals are HSC autonomous. So to first understand the molecular mechanism, we analyze the genome-wide genes expression change by doing the RNA seq of the HSCs from the Y type and ramp one knockout mice. And this RNA seq analysis revealed significant downregulation of the GFS cycling AMP pathway. So, to first study whether CGRP ramp one signals regulate the stem cell mobilization through the GFS cycling AMP pathway, we did the rescue experiment with false choline, which can activate the cycling AMP signaling. So consistent with the data I showed before, you see that the ramp one knockout mice show the mobilization defect, but with false calling treatment, it can completely rescue the mobilization to the white type level, suggesting that the CGRP ramp one signals promote the stem cell mobilization through the GFS cycling MP pathway. So all these data suggest that the sensory neurons derived CGRP signals promote the stem cell mobilization. So this data also led to our next hypothesis, that is ingestion of the spicy food, which can activate the sensory neurons, could promote the stem cell mobilization. So to test this hypothesis, we gave the mice capsaicin diets a week before the GCSF treatment. Then as you can see here, the capsaicin diet can promote the stem cell mobilization into the peripheral blood, suggesting that ingestion of the spicy food which can activate the sensory neurons, enhances the stem cell mobilization. 
But if you feed the RTX mice with the capsaicin diet, it did not promote the stem cell mobilization, which is suggested that the capsaicin diet functions through the sensory neurons. So to first evaluate the number of the functional HSCs that mobilize into the peripheral blood, we did the transplantation experiment with the mobilized peripheral blood from the control and the capsaicin diet feed mice. So as you can see here, the mice received their uh, mobilized peripheral blood from the capsaicin diet treatment mice showed increased chimerism as compared to the control, suggesting that the ingestion of the spicy food promote the stem cell mobilization. So to make a summary of this, uh, this finding, we, our, our, uh, our data showed that the sensory neurons, sensory neurons are required for the stem cell mobilization also identified the sensory nervous system as a essential niche component in the bone marrow. So our data suggests that the sensory neuron derived CGRP signals, but not substance P promote the stem cell mobilization by acting directly on the CGRP receptor that expressed on the HSCs to promote the stem cell mobilization by the GFS cycling MP pathway. So this study also holds the promise of improving the stem cell collection for the bone marrow transplantation therapy. So now I move to the second part of my talk. Uh, these are some ongoing projects in the lab about the aged bone marrow microenvironment regulate the excess one induced clonal hematopoiesis. So we know that during early life, we have a quite large pool of the hematopoietic stem cells. And these stem cells at the divide they accumulate mutations in the stem cells and at a rate of 10 mutations per year. So based on this, at their age about 50, each person has about 1 million coding mutations among the stem cell pool. So this stem cell, these mutations make the each HSC a unique runner with slightly different future. Also, these mutations allows for the competition leading to the clonal hematopoiesis. So clonal hematopoiesis broadly describes the expansion of a clonal population of the blood cells that with somatic mutations, but in the absence of the leukemia. So CHIP is a particular subset of the clonal hematopoiesis that is characterized by the association of the mutations with leukemia-associated genes. So two large studies published in 2014 revealed the most frequently mutated genes in CHIP including the DMT3A, PEP2, and XS1. So this study also found that there is increase in the frequency of the clonal mutation with age. And they found that the chip also associated with increased risk for the blood cancers. So the question is what impact of these mutations on HSC function? So Peggy Goodell's lab did a survey in 2014 of HSC function in 150 individual knockout mice based on the published work. So interestingly, this study found that the majority of the genes has no effect or defect on HSC function. Only a small fraction of these genes can confer the advantage on HSC function, like the TAT2 gene. So as you can see here, when we transplant the TAT2 knockout bone marrow cells into the lethally irradiated recipient mice, you see that the TAC2 knockout cells give higher repopulation activity as compared to the control. Also, this result was further confirmed by transplanting the human cells carrying the TAC2 mutations back into the mice. Then you see that the human cells with TAC2 mutations showed increased chimerism as compared to the control. So all this data suggesting that the TAT2 knockout or mutations could lead to the mutant clonal expansion in the transplanted recipient mice. And the gene I'm most interested in is the XS1 gene and XS1 TM mutation. So XS1 TM mutation is commonly identified in the patients with cheap chronic myeloid diseases and acute myeloid leukemia. So this XS1 TM mutation is a friendship mutation shown here, which can create a truncated protein of the XS1 protein. So, but unlike most of the cheap mutation, we and others found that the XS1 knockout or mutant bone marrow cells did not undergo expansion in the transplanted young recipient 
So as you can see here, this is the wild type control. When we transplant the XS1 knockout cells into the recipient, it showed the reduced chimerism as compared to the control. And as positive control, you see that the type 2 knockout cells lead to the significant increased chimerism as compared to the white type, suggesting that the XS1 knockout cells did not undergo expansion in the transplanted young recipient. Also, I confirmed this result by transplanting the XS1 TM mutant cells into the recipient mice. Also, the result is consistent. You see that XS1 TM mutant cells give lower chimerism as compared to the control. So this result seems to be conflict with the fact that XS1 TM mutation are commonly identified in the chip samples that showed uh, advantage in terms of the clonal expansion. But this also suggests that additional environment factors may also contribute to the XS1 induced clonal hemiplasis. So because I'm a niche person, so I'm particularly interested to study the impact of the age related uh, environment factors First, because we know that there is a huge variation in the latency between the acquisition of a genetic mutation and emergence of the clonal hematopoiesis. Secondly, age is the strongest predictor of clonal hematopoiesis. Thirdly, we found that the detectable clonal hematopoiesis with the candidate drivers were rare in the young participants, but much more common in old participants. And lastly, we know that there are only like two to three fold increase in the mutation frequency, but there are about more than 30 fold in terms of the cancer incidence. So all this data suggesting that additional environment factors related to the age may contribute to the age related blood diseases like the XS1 induced clonal hematopoiesis. So this leads to our hypothesis that the age of bone microenvironment is a critical driver for the xs one induced clonal hematopoiesis. So to test this hypothesis, we take out the donor bone marrow cells from either the white type mice or the xs one tm mutant mice and mix the cells with the CD45.1 competitor and transplant them into lethally irradiated white type young versus old recipients. So after the transplant, we monitor the comparison by flow analysis every four weeks. So interestingly, as you can see here, when we transplant the white type cells into young versus old recipients, the reconstitution is indistinguishable. However, if we transplant the mutant cells into young versus old recipients, the reconstitution is significantly increased in the old recipient as compared to the young controls suggesting that the age of bone marrow microenvironment promote the expansion of the XS1 mutant cells. Also to confirm this result, we set, uh, we set the mice at the 16 weeks after the transplant and look at their donor chimerism in the stem cell and progenitor compartment. So as you can see here, the result is real well consistent. The uh, donor chimerism in the stem cell compartment also increased in older recipient as compared to the control, suggesting again that the aged bone marrow microenvironment promotes the expansion of the XS1 mutant clones. So the next question is how the aged bone marrow microenvironment promotes the expansion of the XS1 mutant cells. So to answer this question, we further compared the cellular and molecular difference in the young versus old bone marrow microenvironment. So here we use the two to four months old mice at the young control and the old mice are 20 to 24 months old. So this analysis revealed that there is a significant increase of the mesenchymal stroma cells and endocellular cells in the age of bone marrow microenvironment as compared to the control. And also you see that there is accumulation of the senescent cells in the stroma and endocellular com compartments. And consistent with the senescent phenotype, you see that these cells are resistant to the apoptosis. So all this data shown here suggests that the aged bone marrow microenvironment exhibits accumulation of the senescent mesenchymal stroma cells and the endocellular cells. So we know that the senescent contribute to the local inflammation in the aged mice. 
So here I measured the, the levels of different chemokine cytokines in the bone marrow extracellular fluid. And this analysis revealed that there is increased, there is inflammatory bone marrow microenvironment in the old mice as compared to the young control with elevated levels of multiple cytokine chemokines shown here. So all this data suggesting that the aged bone marrow microenvironment showed an uh, inflammatory environment with increased senescence and increased number of the niche cells. Also to understand the mechanism, we did the ina seq analysis of the Y-type and XS1 mutant cells from the old mice. So this ina seq analysis with the HSPCs showed that there is upregulation of the inflammatory pathways in the XS1 mutant cells as compared to the control, compared to the Y-type cells, suggesting that the Y-type and XS1 mutant bone marrow cells responded differently to the aged bone marrow microenvironment, which led to our next hypothesis that is aging-associated senescence may, af may affect the ability of the XS1 mutant cells to adapt and expand in aged bone marrow microenvironment. So we would expect that the re rejuvenating the aged bone marrow microenvironment with less senescence could prevent or inhibit the clonal hematopoiesis. So we know that antisenescence has been used to treat the age-related blood diseases. So here we took a similar approach and treat the young and versus old mice with either vehicle control or the ABT263, which is inhibitor of anti-apoptotic protein BCL2 BCXL. So I didn't show the data here, but our study revealed that there is upregulation of the BCL2, BCLXL in the aged uh, niche cells in the bone marrow. That's how we chose the ABT263 for this treatment. So as you can see here, interestingly, the ABT263 treatment can rescue the number of the mesenchymostroma cells and also reduce the number of the senescent stroma cells back to the white type level, to the young level but it did not affect the senescent and the solar cells that much as compared to the stroma cells. And more importantly, we found that the ABT263 treatment can rescue the number of the hematopoietic stem cells in the aged mice. So all this data has suggested that the ABT263 treatment rejuvenates the aged bone marrow microenvironment. So for the next step, we'd like to first test if rejuvenating the aged bone marrow microenvironment with the ABT263 treatment could prevent or inhibit the clonal hematopoiesis. Also, we'd like to investigate how the aged bone marrow microenvironment interact with the XS1 mutant cells to promote the expansion. So for this question, we, we propose to do the site seq analysis to, and to in, further investigate the molecular and the cellular mechanisms. So as I mentioned before, my lab is brand new. So my lab is, uh, is aimed to understand how the bone marrow microenvironment interact with the normal and mutant HSCs during the normal and leukemogenesis. So we are actually looking for like motivated students and postdocs to join my lab. And the current project include that, as I mentioned here, to explore the interactions between the aged bone marrow microenvironment and their uh, HSCs carrying the genetic mutations and to see, to evaluate their contribution to the age-related blood diseases, the clonal hematopoiesis here. Also, we also want to understand the function of the sensory neurons during normal aging and leukemogenesis. And the other project I did have time to mention today is to study the role of the macrophage in the bone marrow niche. So at the end, I'd like to thank the support and help from my previous mentor, Dr. Pofranat and Dr. Zhang Imukado. So also I'd like to thank all the funding support from the ASH Follow to Faculty Scholar Award and NIHK Award and all the startup fundings. So thank you so much. I would like to take any questions. Yeah. Um, I think question in the first part of your talk. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious um, I understand the thermalization of mm -hmm. the cells, mm -hmm. but bringing up oxygen. 
HPS thing to get more. Like, HSCs, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. But I, I, I just, uh, I was just wondering what's known about like, teaching normal physiological situations where that happens spontaneously? Yeah, that's like, a good question. Stress or something. And I was wondering if the manipulations you do to that effect mm -hmm. is kind of. Uh, experimentally used transfer uh, mobilization, mm -hmm. if, if that would have an effect on some kind of physiological security, what would you do? Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, in my study, I more focused on the enforced stem cell mobilization for the transplantation therapy because we need to collect the stem cells for the transplantation. And, and under the study state, actually, they're also like the circulation of the stem cells mobilized into the into the peripheral blood from the bone marrow. So in my, in my study, I didn't cover that part. That would be one of the future directions I'd like to study under the physiological status mm -hmm. instead of the enforced stem cell mobilization. That's a really interesting question. Also on the stress condition, we are interested in the aging and other stress condition. We would like to study, further explore the function of the sensory neurons during the stress hematopoiesis as well. But here, I only covered the situation of the enforced stem cell mobilization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is anything known about the spatial pattern of delivery of the neuropeptides from the sensory nerves? Uh, like, can you get rid of the nerve cells and then just do a blanket treatment? This would be an ego experiment. Which, and can, I mean, does that still work or does it have to be delivered very locally? Yeah. On synapses? Yeah, in my case, actually, the CGRP was delivered back into the mice more systemically okay. because we put the CGRP in the pump and put the pump on the skin of the mice so it can systemically deliver, deliver into the whole tissues. But in the bone marrow, we know that the sensory neuron is the main contributor to the CGRP levels. So after we deploy the sensory neurons, we saw that the CGRP level is significantly reduced in bone marrow, almost too long. So the sensory neuron is the main uh, contributor to the CGRP level in the bone marrow. But well, where the sensory neurons innervate the bone, as I understand it, isn't that pretty reproducible from animal to animal? Or yes, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the CGRP mainly secreted by the terminals that innervate the bone marrow. So it released by the vesicles and locally released to the bone marrow. But in terms of my experiment setting, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. In my case, it's more like systemic effect. Also for the capsaicin diet, we gave the mice capsaicin diet. It's more like systemic effect. But when we measure the CGRP level locally in the bone marrow, we can also detect the upregulation of the CGRP level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just to follow up, uh -huh. have you tried instead of giving the capsaicin in your diet to put it like on your skin or some other way? I'm just wondering how to do this. Well. Yeah, actually, for the capsaicin diet, first of all, I can start with the CGRP treatment because the half life for the CGRP is really short, it's like half an hour. So when we try the injection, it doesn't work, like ingesting twice a day. So then we went back to the pump which can continuously deliver the CGRP back into the mice. Also for the capsaicin, the same idea, we want to continue to deliver the, increase the CGRP systemically. That's how we treat the uh, capsaicin diet. But if we never try the capsaicin injection. I think it's the same at the CGRP. If you only give like two shots to the mice with the capsaicin uh, solution, I don't think that's going to work. Because with the CGRP injection, that, that it does not work. It does not promote the stem cell mobilization. When you only give the CGRP continuously with the CGRP pump, that works. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking it's more like the, yeah, more continuous delivery, but not like just uh, two shots or a few shots every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking yeah. about the ability for transplant to occur in the aged mice in your ATSS1 mutant cells. The age, oh, you mean the next project? Yes. Uh -huh. 
what what yeah, the question whether mm -hmm. or not it's a population level effect or if it's due to inheritance of specific mutations during the course of aging uh actually in my case i did look i didn't look at the clonal level so in my case we only look at the hematopoietic stem cells the whole population during the aging but that's a really great question i think for the future study we need to look at more like the at the clonal level not the whole bug uh, stem cell population I think my, my question, and it's a simple one, I was uh -huh. wondering if you saw a, a clonal expansion of, of uh, different mutants differentially uh, between different blood diseases. Yeah, we have a look at that broadly. We are particularly interested in this gene because the XS1 is different from other genes, like the TAT2 DMT3A. When you transplant the DMT3A and knockout cells into the uh, young recipient, you already see the expansion. But in this case, the X1 uh, gene is different because when we transplant them into the young recipient, you didn't see the expansion. So that's why I started to thinking about the additional environment may play a role. But we haven't looked at that broadly, but that would be one of the experiments we have to do to see whether like the age for myra micro environment also contribute to other gene mutations as well in terms of the clonal hematopoiesis. Yeah, I think we have to look at that more broadly to see if this only like X1 specific or like more broadly to other genes as well. Yeah. Yeah, it just seemed to be a perhaps even different diseases yeah. like, related to differential expansion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, mm -hmm. it's like a population level question of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thanks. that's really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that like in mice, when they get older, their thymus is replaced with fat and then their blood cell proportions sort of change. Mm -hmm. um, when you're taking the mice and like sort of rejuvenating their niche to, or their microenvironment, mm -hmm. for example, again for mouse, does that also change how their blood cells are developing in different? Yeah, actually, I haven't looked at other uh blood tissues like the thymus. We only focused on the bone marrow, but that'd be real interesting to take a look. I think, yeah, because this treatment is also like more systemic. It would be interesting to look at other tissues as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering um, in, if this gene from the second mm -hmm. are there um, 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 polymorphisms or mutations in this gene associated with like multiple myeloma? Because in multiple myeloma, yeah. there is this precursor stage where they uh -huh. have the Expansion, mm -hmm. but it seems to be like under control for indeterminate periods of time, and then in some people, mm -hmm. it will just go crazy at a specific point in their lives. Yeah, that's so really I interesting. There's a new association between, yeah, for the XS1 gene, it's more, most likely discovered in the patients with myeloid diseases. I don't know much about the multiple myeloma, but in most of the cases, it's associated with the uh, CMML chronic myeloid leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia and the clonal hematopoiesis. Yeah, I need to dig into the multiple myeloma to see that associated as well. But and also if some patients that are treated for multiple myeloma, they can develop, develop that more. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And I wonder if some change yeah, that's, in the niche that mm -hmm. then makes secondary. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I need to dig into that direction as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with there are no more questions, let's uh, let's thank Shigal uh, again. For yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamiya.